welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. Well, it seems like the rest of Silicon Valley got a little bit jealous of all the fails happening in crypto, and they wanted to get in on the action too. Welcome to Scam Economy, everyone. I am your host, Matt Binder, and on today's episode of the show, we're going to talk about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank the preferred financial institution for so many of our country's wonderful venture capitalists and tech founders. It turns out that regardless of the decades-long relationship you've had with those guys, you let them know you're in just a little bit of money trouble, and they'll say, peace, and fear monger, and cause a bank run, and before you know it, government regulators are taking over because you're running out of money. This comes fresh off of the previous episode of Scam Economy, where we talked about the struggles of the crypto-friendly bank institutions, Silvergate and Signature Bank, which by the way, since last episode, both those banks gone. Now, before we dive in to this very juicy episode of the show, let me first tell you how you can support Scam Economy. You can go to patreon.com slash Matt Binder to sign up for a monthly paid subscription. You can go to youtube.com slash Matt Binder and subscribe to the channel where the video version of the show drops. And you could also go to scameconomy.com for all the links to the audio podcast versions of this show. Now let's get to Silicon Valley Bank and the Ayn Rand loving crybaby VCs who begged for the government to save them. And of course, we got some stuff on Silvergate and Signature Bank too. And joining me now to discuss everything that just happened, and there, there's a lot to talk about, is Edward Angueso Jr. He is a freelance writer, co-host of This Machine Kills podcast, and writer of the Tech Bubble newsletter. Edward, it is a pleasure to have you on Scam Economy. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. I'm excited to talk with you. Yeah, I've been, I've been meaning to have you on for quite a while, so I'm glad. I'm glad Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsed, so we have this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, yeah, you know, um, I'm glad that it collapsed and that the government stepped in and made sure all uh, depositors will be made whole. It's, right. It's yeah. Time well, for celebration. Yeah. You know, when, when one door closes, another door opens in the, in the sense uh, when it comes to the VCs, uh, when one door opens, another door opens and another door opens. It seems like no doors ever really close for them. They're on a different playing field. It's um, I think, you know, Silicon Valley and their ilk, they're always on a different playing field. Right. Right. On account of having all that money. Right. Yes. So, you know, I should first say that, you know, for people who are who are uh, tuning in to Scam Economy, this episode of Scam Economy, um, last episode of uh, the previous episode of the show, I had on uh, Bennett Tomlin and we discussed uh, what was going on over at Silvergate and Signature Bank. There are updates to what happened with those two banks, and they, they really sort of pop up into this broader story. So I want to tell everyone to hold on tight because we'll be getting into those two banks as well during this episode. But also, you know, Silicon Valley Bank probably isn't as crypto oriented as the other things we talk about on this show. While there is obviously some uh, exposure there, uh, I, I do want to bring up that I think that it's important to still do this episode because a lot of what we're going to talk about really does fall into the overarching theme of how the tech industry really as a whole is one big scam economy. Like it's, it's not just crypto. Right. Right. I think, <clears throat> you know, it's hard for a lot of people to, I think, accept that because, you know, tech has a magical place in our lives, right? When you think tech, you usually think products that through digital means or through some advanced technical application improve something, they improve quality of life, they improve the production process, they improve the ability to deploy medication or to harness energy or to get around from place to place, you know, but the tech that we're talking about is, is, is really far removed from that. The stuff that by and large and by far and large generates a lot of the attention from venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, um, a lot of money, a lot of capital, the stuff that 
you know, might provide some ancillary benefits, but it's really about in one way or another squeezing out as much money as possible from people, whether that's trapping them on platforms, whether that's trapping them on platforms as consumers or as workers, whether that's commodifying more of their lives by inserting microtransactions and markets and uh, digital commodities, whether that's, you know, introducing surveillance or killing machines or militarization. Uh, and that is the, the tech that we really need to be concerned about that Silicon Valley does and, and, and ends up being, you know, a, a huge part of the innovative innovation success story that they tell. Right. And that they use institutions like Silicon Valley Bank, right, to finance in advance. Are you trying to tell me, Edward, that those aren't the types of tech that we talk about when the VCs are opining about how everything they do makes our lives better? <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> it's interesting because it's like there are some areas, right, where there are, you know, improvements. But of course, it's it, then it gets into like improvements in the side of a system that's already fucked up. Right. With climate, with uh, bioscience, there's, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, for example, but also parts of VC fund and back those things and advances happen there although there it's a whole other discussion about whether we should have a system where our climate energy or climate tech and our pharma tech is uh, privately developed uh, and, and and the profits are privatized and losses socialized right but for the most part <laughs> right the tech that we have and the tech that we get is not the tech that you and I would be interested in I'm not we, we're not interested in doorbell cameras we're not interested in wide hail apps on demand we're not interested in these delivery service we're not interested in a lot of these things that we've been convinced that we need and should have over the past decade or more right right you know I will probably I wanted to start at the very beginning with Silicon Valley Bank but we're having this discussion and I sort of want to just bring this up at the very top because a lot of what I saw this weekend were, were a lot of these tech founders and, and VCs, these venture capitalists, talking about how they were so shocked by the outrage against them. Like they had, they had no idea that they were so hated and, and they acted and they acted like um, everyone, like it's the children who are wrong. That Principal Skinner, um, you know, the, uh, Simpsons meme. And, and I just want to start this by saying like I was someone who in my teenage years had like Friendster and MySpace. I was growing up during the, the you know, the, the beginnings of social media. I remember getting Facebook in college. And I was someone who was like, you know, I was one of those people checking TechCrunch and Mashable and all those startup uh, covering uh, uh, tech blogs in the like the mid 2000s. That, and I was like, oh, this is so cool. This stuff is awesome. And, you know, we can obviously go on and on about all the problems with social media. But at the very beginning, there was there was a lot of cool things in terms of, like, the way we could connect and communicate and, you know, uh, uh, build relationships with people who we otherwise would never have had the opportunity to do so. Like, you know, I was able to reach out to you and make this episode happen thanks to social media. Like, you know, there are negatives, lots of negatives, but there are also some positives that they, you know, that social media did bring. And I feel like as, you know, so I was one of those people who was like, oh, this tech stuff, this, this, you know, the, 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 the startup scene is so cool. But as I got older and the industry, uh, you know, evolved and changed, you sort of realize that, uh, you know, it's not the same as it was. This, like, cool, revolutionary people trying to do the right thing. Like, even in their own slogans, they've changed how they they feel. Like, Google dropping the whole don't be evil slogan. Whatever you think, they clearly felt like they didn't even need to pretend anymore. Like, the tech, the tech industry has changed in ways that made even people who were uh, enamored by it look at it and say, hey, I don't think this is so great anymore. And they don't seem to even, uh, you know, uh, come to terms like the tech industry, the founders, the VCs. They don't even seem to have come to, to terms with the fact that they've even lost those people. Like some of the biggest critics I've seen are like old school engineers and developers, honestly. Like it's not even like, like uh, you know, technophobes. It's like the people who help bid, build the foundational stuff that they're all taking advantage of. Yeah, you know, I think I think a big part of that is that, you know, the internal logic or contradictions at the heart of the tech system have, have really kind of shown their face over the past few years. You know, like tech has always been and Silicon Valley has always been the darling of a very specific confluence of of a historical and geopolitical and financial factors, right? Tax loopholes that were secured by 
right wing elements of society that were you know pushing for lobbying for uh, protection on their capital gains and trying to figure out ways that they can make more money off of limited partnerships or other sorts of arrangements that would preserve as much money as possible and that they could put it into other ventures, right? Um, there's also a history of Silicon Valley itself being a darling of uh, the Pentagon and, and certain types of technologies and certain types of partnerships between the Pentagon and the private sector being prioritized and funding channels being established in that way. And then certain types of ideas about what so the technology is supposed to do and how it's supposed to be used. Um, that have come in and out of public consciousness in cycles and or waves that kind of are supposed to override or get people to overlook militaristic origins, political origins, extractive origins of a lot of the tech uh, associated with Silicon Valley. You know, really, you know, two really great books on this. My two, some of my favorite books on this are, you know, Malcolm Harris has recently released uh, Palo Alto, which is a really magisterial history of, of the region and its, an effect, and its effect on the development of our economy and the global system of capitalism itself. Um, the, you know, the, with the with the kind of underlying thesis that California, it's only really after California gets settled and and the the beginning elements of that Palo Alto system get established that you finally have capitalism in a global form, and that a lot of the people, a lot of the capital, a lot of the industry, a lot of the you know connective tissues developed there and practices are attempted to be exported elsewhere. Um, but also Imperial San Francisco, which talks about how. California is also very much like an artificial place defined by the mining, uh, by the mining industry and by the gold rushes there, by the wealth that came out of it and how the people with that wealth tried to construct a society that preserved their wealth um, and made and shaped, you know, what kind of politics, culture, economics would come up around them. And I think similarly, we've seen something here, which has happened, which is like the inordinate amount of wealth, the success, the political power that these people have accumulated over the past few decades has given them the chance to help you know, direct shift influence the way that society develops and the type of tech we have, but in ways that are becoming increasingly decoupled from what people who work in the industry, what people who are drawn into the industry right, want, right? You know, everyone is not entering this industry to make more money than God. A lot of people enter the industry as workers or as founders or engineers because they're interested in like solving some specific problem or because they're told they can save the world or because they think that this is where the magic happens and that, you know, there's something special about tech. Um, and the people who ended up d deciding and deploying them and allocating resources to to structure people and and achieve certain uh, outcomes, right? Um, those are the people who have visions for the world that have become increasingly disgusting and alien, I think, to the workers and increasingly the population. Right. Yeah. So so now that we have we we've sort of established this prologue here, let's get into. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank specifically and, and what just happened. Um, can you explain to people, because, you know, if, if you listen just to these VCs, you would think that, you know, mainstream, uh, Main Street America is literally uh, had their finger on the pulse seeing Silicon Valley Bank in the news headlines and going, oh, my God, not Silicon Valley Bank. Most people never heard of this bank before today. Uh, it, yes, it's a commercial bank. Yes, apparently they were like the 16th or 17th uh, biggest bank in the country. But most people don't have their money with a regional bank like Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and so the first time their introduction to Silicon Valley Bank or SVB, as we'll probably uh, you know, call it throughout this episode, uh, is what happened just this past week. So can you explain to people... Um, what is Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah, Silicon Valley Bank has been around for decades, you know, uh, it's been around since I think 1983, um, 1983. And it's basically the you know, best way to think of it is preferred bank of Silicon Valley, right? Uh, it's built up relationships, connections with, with the industry, with founders, with startups. Um, it has, it's, it's a place for them to go because, you know, when you're a startup, you, you, you're in this problem where you don't actually have assets or any sort of like real revenue that would allow you to get real financing or traditional financing. So you could go to a few places, you know, you go to financiers and investors, you get loans from banks um, like Silicon Valley Bank that have close relationships with the industry. Uh, but this bank ended up becoming a place where investors, venture, venture capital investors, angel investors, funds, startups would go and park their money. Right. And, 
you know, for a while, that was a system that made sense uh, because of the network, the tightly knit network that was there, because of the relationships they had with people, because of the preferential access or deals or, that they would provide to people in the industry to kind of entice them to park the money there. And they had, you know, going into 2019, about like $62 billion worth of deposits from customers, um, largely, again, you know, tech focused. Um, there was a shift when, you know, from 2019 to 2022, you saw like a really big boom in uh, venture capital valuations, in venture capital fund sizes, and in deal sizes and checks cut to startups. And so you started to see a massive swell of deposits inside of Silicon Valley Bank. Right? And so this, Silicon had a, Valley, this hmm? had a lot to do with the pandemic. Um, yeah. Because you know, people were home in front of their computers or working remotely. Mm -hmm. And so they started using all these different uh, platforms that maybe didn't have a user base uh, that size. People all of a sudden were you know, need, were getting big, went to VCs, would get funding. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, think about how before 2020, how many people even heard of Zoom? And now it's like one of the big tech companies up there. Now imagine yeah. all the various uh, tech companies that maybe didn't get as big as Zoom, but still blew up to some uh, level that was much higher than they previously were. Uh, a lot of money going into tech during that era. Uh, not surprising, I guess, though, knowing how these people think in the industry that the uh, the money wouldn't always be there. The pandemic would eventually mm -hmm. <laughs> subside and mm -hmm. everyone wouldn't be sitting in front of their computers till the end of time. Yeah, and I would also say another factor here was, you know, the, re the reason why the pandemic had that effect or was or had such fertile ground to accelerate the valuations is also because we were kind of already in an asset bubble ongoing. I mean, like there had been in the decade past or, you know, or in the years before because of low interest rates, a growing acceleration to the size of money that was in the industry. And you also saw the emergence increasingly of larger and larger funds and of mega funds, you know, a lot of funds. To take one specific example, one period after SoftBank, this te Japanese tele uh, telecommunications conglomerate, uh, announced its vision fund, right, $100 billion, or it's supposed to be $100 billion of uh, capital that it would deploy and invest in the tech sector. A lot of, a lot of other places started announcing larger funds than they historically had, right? So you started to see a lot of large funds emerge. You started to see funds spun out of those larger funds that had a lot of money. So you also, so you already had a dynamic where people are thinking, all right, we need to put all this money somewhere. We need to find startups. We need to find places to hold it. We need to find funds to work with. We need to find, you know, LPs that will put the money with us, or we need to convince them to put more LP uh, money up with us. Um, and, the, and the pandemic, right, really inflated all of that you had the rise specifically of a lot of the remote work or uh, remote work connected technologies you had attempts to try to bring and focus on gig uh, gig economy on uh, you know app-based labor platforms uh, trying to find new uber of x again but for delivery services food specifically but also medicine and groceries um, Those the, geniuses always with their great ideas of uh, right. Uber for this, Uber for that. <laughs> right. Uh, How, if no, only, if only wrong. I had the uh, the brain of the Albert Einsteins of the tech world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ignoring that Uber's never made any money uh, or made a single profit, but they were like, "Hey, you know, let's put, let's, you know, it's it seems smart if we do Uber of X during the pandemic, we'll get profits." Um, so you saw a lot of, you know, see just a larger pool to play with and a lot more money to play with that contributed to the deposits in Silicon Valley Bank really taking off and tripling by 2022, and this is where the beginning of the crisis, you know, starts to kick in, where they have all this money, they don't know what to do with it. They can't really loan it out at a rate that matches the deposit growth. And so they decide, you know, we're going to do what other banks would do or well, half of what other banks would do, which is like we're going to buy some sort of asset that's guaranteed to get a return. And in this case, they bought um, securities that were backed by the government. So treasury bills and mortgage bonds, um, 10 to 30 year uh, mortgage bonds. And they said, OK, we'll put we'll put hundreds of billion. We'll put 100 plus billion there. You keep it there for a bunch of years. You can sell the asset. You know, interest rates aren't going to go up. Why would they go up? All these startups need low interest rates. The economy has been doing well under low interest rates. The party's going to keep going on forever. So we can just keep this shit here um, and nothing bad will happen. 
And that's Six exactly what happens. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Edward. Have a great night. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is amazing that you would put hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, you know, just take, just hold your money, walk over to one thing and go, here you go, have at it. Like, it's like, it's like, what's going on here? What are you doing? It, it seems pretty like, it seems like any sort of risk assessment person would have been like, eh, maybe we're not, maybe we shouldn't put that much into this one thing or this two, these two things, or even that much into this small area or variety of things you know it, it, it there was a lack of diversification because i think that they did think there was diversification they thought like oh well you know we're providing all these different types of tech startups right and we're and we're parking into and we're parking with um we're working with all these different tech startups that are in um uber of x or uber of y we're working with climate related ones we're working with automation related ones or ai related ones you know but the reality was like they're all more or less the same thing, which is like exotic bets that can only happen in low interest rate environments. Because if you come to me and you tell me that if I loan you a bunch of money um, in 10 years, you're going to have like robots on the moon or some bullshit, right? Or, you know, to, 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 I'll, I'll use real examples because I don't want to be unfair. Uh, let's say you are a consulting company that won't be named and you go to Mas uh, you go to MBS and you say, I will build a, an artificial moon for a city you want to build in the future and it will have uh, drones that will help make that moon possible. You say maybe like just, you know, it only costs like X or Y amount of money. You know, maybe you can get a startup to do it. They can do it in 10 to 20 years. You just loan them a lot of money. But since interest rates are low, you know, you don't really have to worry about that money. You can lose that money. You can get that money. You can find a place to put it. If it fails, just put the money elsewhere. And if it succeeds, it's a massive payout and better than you can do parking your money elsewhere. Well, you know, when interest rates rise, people say, well, why would I put my money with this like, you know, gamble? That's probably not going to happen when I can put it with something else that's a little bit more tangible and realistic. Um, the problem is, you know, for this industry that tends to be like my friends who are more proven and reliable, uh, or people on my social network and not like maybe this entire enterprise <laughs> that relies on low interest rates is not the, uh, uh, is not the best place to park money. Right. Right. And to take right. on risk. It, it's pretty interesting how at the end of the day, um, the company that, uh, you know, provided all of these financial services, for the Uber of this and the Uber of that and the next startup that was doing the Uber of the next thing ended up really being the Uber of banking themselves in terms yeah. of them not making any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um and that, you know, and so and we come to what happened with SVP, which is like, you know, okay, once interest rate hikes happened, they bought a lot of bonds that were worth a lot of money. Uh, and they had to mature over time. And, and the idea is they mature and they give you a certain yield on them, but it takes a while and you just have to hold them. Well, when interest rates started to hike and they were worth less than what they could do with it, they came into a problem, which is that they didn't really have the liquidity, to, uh, didn't have as much liquidity as they would want. And people got a little shaky and, and nervous about it, right? So they sold a bunch of those bonds and assets to raise money. And then they said they were gonna sell stock to cover that hole. And that just sent everyone into a panic and they pulled their money or started trying to pull their money. A founders fund, which is Peter Thiel's a group, uh, told all of its portfolio companies to pull out a bunch of other venture capital funds, told all their portfolio companies to pull out. And so you had like a stampede exit for the door. In fact, I think there's a tweet thread that someone wrote where he kind of admits to planning with his friends all to like orchestrate a withdrawal of their deposits. And then he thought that, <laughs> thought that SVB, since its price was dropping because everyone was taking his money out, that he could buy the stock and that it would be good <laughs> and that'd be a good investment. <clears throat> um, don't, uh, you know, it turned out not being one, right? Because people stampeded for the door that undermined confidence in the bank. Uh, there was a run on the bank and the run and its deposits. Uh, I think by the end of it, by the last night, Thursday night, uh, they had tried to withdraw like $42 billion out of the, out of the bank. Um, and, and on Friday morning, the federal government stepped in with FDIC and said, okay, the bank is ours now. We're going to try to find a buyer on the weekend. And if we can't, then we'll just liquidate the bank. And we'll give everyone who has under $250,000 all their money. And then everyone else will get 
uh, receiver certificates, which will pay out dividends as you know the as, you know after the auctions and over time, and you'll get your money eventually. But the VC seem to have not really understood that last part, which is that they'll get their money eventually, and started screeching and screaming um, right. over let, the let, weekend. Let, let's get into that in just a second, because I want to I want to just rewind just a little bit to that. Um, you know, that Wednesday when uh, when SVB, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, sort of came out and announced and, and caught people, uh, you know, who pay attention to this stuff by surprise um, when they announced that they, they needed to raise capital. I think they needed like something like two point something billion dollars, they said, after, you know, they sold off their, you know, their uh, investments to uh, at, at like a loss of like one point eight billion or something like that. And those same VCs who end up whining, and not the same exact ones. I'm not going to, let's be clear, uh, we're going to hear from some guys who, uh, in, in just a minute, who I'm not sure were or were still, I, they might have been, but not anymore, uh, SVB uh, customers or clients. But the same types of VCs, the same people who think, that you know, uh, capitalism is perfect. Uh, make as much money doing these uh, random startups with the intent of just selling them to some bigger company. That's how it works. Not actually making any revenue. Um, these same types of VCs uh, who live in this bubble, mm -hmm. they're the ones who sort of create this mess and, and do to Silicon Valley Bank. What what causes the whole problem? Like, yeah, sure, Silicon Valley Bank made these bad investments, but it wasn't until the fear mongering started. I saw some tweet from a founder saying he was in like a a Slack group with yes. two hundred other founders, two hundred other one. founders, and they were all going nuts with a uh, you know apocalyptic scenarios, uh, you know, uh, you know, revving each other up to the point where. Everyone just starts running to SVB and withdrawing all their money, creating this bank run. And I think the guy even ends up going, oh, this guy might be in some trouble. I, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in this specific area, but it doesn't seem on the up and up where he's in no. this chat. He's, <laughs> he's in the chat helping create this bank run. And then after he withdraws his money, he goes, you know what? I'm going to buy some shares in the stock for SVB because it's lower than I think it will be. I think, you know, I created this problem, but I think it'll, I think it'll fix itself. So I'm going to also try to make a, a profit off of it. God, these people. But anyway, so, so these same VCs who end up the same types, again, not, we're not specifically talking about the same exact people, but these same types um, who whine and cry about the government running in and saving them over the weekend created this very issue that, again, SVB fucked up, but due to their placement in the, you know, the industry, uh, they probably would have been able to, uh, do something to, to fix the issue, uh, some sort of stopgap measure. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot, there's, uh, the one thing that I think is interesting, and um, you know, Brian Merchant at the LA Times, really great columnist, pointed out pointed this out in a column that is similar to the article I wrote and where it ends about how VCs, you know, this episode casts uh, doubt on the claim that VCs should control the direction of tech development in this country, right? But his point is that um, you know, uh, capitalists venture capitalists, their friends and banks were able to pretty quickly cobble together $44 billion to um, purchase Twitter, which it was, you know, by all accounts, a shit investment, right? <laughs> Something that they have destroyed the value of completely. Um, and there seemed to have been no sort of solidarity amongst them to try to cobble together however much. I mean, probably, you know, a few, a few hundred billion, maybe less, 100 to 200 billion to buy the bank, which is their lifeblood, their pillar, their structural support system, uh, the infrastructure that allows a lot of them to sustain this ecosystem. And, you know, that says a lot of things. That says that they're more interested in their personal gain than they are in their the, the very thing that sustains them as a class. That means they'll also take this advantage to, like, you know, 
gin up hysteria, to gin up propaganda, to gin up and to throw more tantrums uh, to get what they want, which is full bailout. Instead of figuring out a solution, which might have cost them a little bit money up front, but would have allowed them to secure and uh, secure, you know, this this institution of the of the ecosystem and maybe figure out a way to talk about what the fuck happened and how they had this bank run panic off of nothing really i mean yeah there was a mismatch there was a mismatch in the in the assets and they shouldn't have invested so much in, in assets that were only good in low at rate interest environment and they shouldn't have depositors that were only low interest rate um uh, depositors or depositors that were good in low interest rate environments um but this was a situation that could have been avoided if there had been a little bit more communication and if there had been more collaboration on the venture capitalists. And from what I can see and from what you talked about, the only collaboration seems to have been how do we profit from this, which came in. How do we like, you know, either try to pull out money from this? How do we try to short it? How do we try to uh, buy in and then profit on the ride back up? How do we try to spark hysteria about other banks failing so that we can be in a position to get the federal government to step in and say there's a contagion? You know, these were the things that were on their mind instead of, as they insisted, uh, the startups that had their the early startups that had their operating capital in there or their operating um, cash in there or the reserves in there or the payroll in there, right? You know, if you were really interested in the ecosystem, if, 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 if uh, venture capital is so important to technological innovation, why was the solution not to actually orchestrate a massive buyout, but instead to say, you know, let's beg the federal government for a bailout, even though we don't believe in bailouts. Um, and then let's like do a ragtag group of investors banding together to promise to pledge a payroll support for some individual firms who happen to see this on Twitter, who happen to reach out to us, or who happen to be in our network that we're connected to. I mean, all of this, when you just spend a few seconds looking at the response that these people had, the most selfish, craven, uh, childish, and greedy response that they could have possibly had. But that's because that's who they are, and that's the concern that I have, right? Uh, the piece that I wrote about this, about how venture capitalists are a problem, you know, I'm not really concerned here with like the, the early stage startups that have their money there. I'm not really concerned there with even the engineers or the workers who have their money there or who have it entangled in their lives and are doing wealth management or mortgages, right, with with this bank. I'm concerned about the venture capitalists who took advantage of a situation where something that everyone benefited off of was in danger and they figured out how to profit off of it because I think that sort of ethos is – driving and animating their focus on what gets invested in and what gets built in the society at large. Right, right. And we, we should name drop some because we're talking about, uh, you know, VCs as a whole, but we're talking, we're, we're, people might be listening and wondering, well, well, who who would have had the billions to, to help out here and, and, sort, and have this solidarity? Well, we're talking about, like, the bank that helped people. Again, they might still not be, Customers, although I think one of the per people I'm about to mention is, uh, for at least some of his companies, but they, this bank was certainly uh, a part of their rise to where they are today. We're talking about people like Peter Thiel, uh, people like Elon Musk. Uh, these are people who all use this bank and talk about how uh, uh, important it is for you know the VCs to have this sort of... Uh, 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 industry uh not industry um this infra uh, infrastructure institution that's what i'm looking for behind them yeah you know i mean like you know some of the the more obvious ones peter theo elon musk even although i don't know if he has the facilities to do that with all the debt he took on to to finance the twitter acquisition well he sure had time uh, even... to uh, tweet about uh, maybe he should t someone said you should buy a uh, silicon valley bank and he's like maybe well, i should consider it <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> funding secured <laughs> <laughs> you know, looking into it he like... tweeted looking into it i'm sure <laughs> Right. His favorite thing to say, <laughs> looking into it. Our friends like David Sachs, um, Peter Thiel, our friends like uh, Mark Andreessen, you know, who I have to say had a normal reaction to my article and called and said that uh, tried to com call me a Nazi uh, for, for writing it, which, you know, means I hit a nerve. But I think that, like, you know, these sorts of people, the ones who they've created funds, multi billion dollar funds. 
and also venture capital firms as well. You know, you could get in Sequoia, you know, if you really wanted to, or, you know, you know, sort of established, um, what's the marquee investors, you know, to use a fancy word. Right. Um, but instead there's no effort to do that. And why is there no effort to do that? Well, I mean, there are two, like I said, there are two options, either it's these people, the quality of venture capitalists, the quality of capitalists has dropped so low that these people don't understand when a move is in their class interest and don't have any solidarity with one another unless it's in opposition and antagonism to another class, right? That's one option. And another is also that they are just so greedy that they can't possibly see. Well, I mean, uh, that kind of blends into it or uh, that they're just so greedy that they're also interested really in just like profiting off of it, right? So you could have had some of these marquee investors and venture capital firms um, step in, right, and and say, well, you know, backstop, or we'll figure out a solution here, or we'll try to provide confidence, or we'll try to right this wrong, and then, you know, we'll have a moment where we learn from it. But instead, what's going to happen is they got all their money, they're made whole, and they go about trying to craft the narrative that people should accept about why this happened, and how this happened, and what needs to be done next. And that's what they're busy at work with. That was what the tantrum was really about it was trying to set a narrative and that's what this will be about also in the coming days and weeks um, trying to set a narrative trying to get policy reforms trying to offload uh, blame to everyone except themselves right right so let's get let's actually dive right into this this the the, the headline part of your piece and I should say it I don't think I've mentioned the whole name the, your piece in slate that was just came out uh, today while we're talking March 13th 2023. Uh, the incredible tantrum venture capitalists threw over Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, if you were on Twitter this past week, and it wasn't just on Twitter, you saw some things. I think uh, I saw like Gary Tan on CNBC. Um, there were VCs basically, uh, I don't know if they showed some solidarity and coordinated who was going to do what in the back end. Or <laughs> probably not, but who knows? <laughs> Uh, it seems like pretty natural, like based on instinct. They didn't need to coordinate this. But these guys were out everywhere friggin uh, demanding that they be bailed out, that, they, that that the money come through. And they try to to me like we'll, we'll, we'll discuss some of the specific tweets and I'll, I'll read some of them. But to me, the grossest, the, the absolute grossest thing I saw, um, I think might have been from uh, Jason Calacanis. I think that's how you say his last name. Uh, yeah. David Sachs co-host on the All In podcast. He's a fellow VC himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he was some guy who got lucky early on. Like all these guys, they were just in the yeah, right place. Yeah, he's an angel investor for Uber and a few other uh, yeah, startups. They, and got lucky. they were all at the right place at the right time when their early 2000s web project took off and Yahoo was buying everyone under the sun for hundreds of millions of dollars. These guys were all like, you know, they were born on third base and they think they hit a triple type thing. Um, you know, this guy was out there trying to fear monger among his followers who most this guy's got a lot of followers on Twitter um, who aren't. Uh, well off and connected like him who are more in the the main uh, street America type individual and trying to tell them how you know if we don't help people like me out right now it's going to be all of you lining up at the bank on Monday uh, you know with your little uh, uh, <laughs> uh, please sir could I have another <laughs> type bullshit like give me a break <laughs> give me an Oliver Twist uh, no thank you that's not what was going to happen uh, and you know, I think the biggest disconnect is like banks are, and we, I talk about this all the time when we're usually talking about crypto on this show is that banks are uh, the one of the main uh, differences about banks and like the crypto exchanges is that banks are FDIC insured, meaning that, uh, if a bank is to go under $250,000 that are in, up to $250,000 that's in your account is is guaranteed the the federal government will step in and make sure you have that money you are you are good to go um news flash to all the vcs out there who were trying to fear monger among main street america i believe last i saw uh according to the federal reserve's re most recent survey that the median amount of money that the average american household has in their bank 
is something around five thousand dollars. Now, Edward, I don't know. Uh, I'm not so good at math. Can you help me <laughs> out here? Is that well below two hundred and fifty k? I mean, I, I think don't that's know. Okay. Just that just hits the limit. I think that just <laughs> is right below it. It's it was it was infuriating to see this like and I do think luckily they were being called out for the most part I think uh, you know at least the most vocal among their followers weren't following their bullshit um, but no doubt about it these guys were definitely uh, causing some sorts of issues yeah I mean you know I think these guys it, it's really interesting right because like you pointed out and like you said. Most Americans have balances that are well below the FDIC limit, right? And also, most Americans do not live in the region where this bank was. So if there was a contagion, they would have been, they would have been guaranteed, right? Uh, but also, you know, you look at the composition of the deposits, and, you know, we were getting estimates that 87 to 90% of these accounts were uninsured because they had 250000 or over, right? But when you, like, the thing that, it has to be emphasized a million times over is uninsured does not mean you'll get none of it back. Like in this scenario, the absolute worst case scenario, because we were dealing with bonds that had not matured yet, is that the, you know, at the, in the worst case scenario, maybe you'd get 80, 85 cents on the dollar, right? So you get 80, 85 you know, percent of your, your, your money back um, because of the certificate, but that's not enough. That's not enough for these people, right? So you have to stoke fear everywhere else and cause people to lose actual money, right? Because then they caused runs on stocks. They got people's uh, – they they tried to cause, you know, and I think today a bunch of stocks halted, right? And people are trying to say, see, see, it's a contagion. No, that's not what the contagion would be. The contagion would be is the actual bank's health bad? What do the sheet – what do the books look like, right? Do they actually have enough deposits? Should there actually be a run on it? Can they confidently communicate to their clients that things are going to be okay? Um, and for the most part, everyone can, except for this one Silicon Valley bank that couldn't because they they weren't. They weren't in good health, right? They tried to do it to the other bank in Silicon Valley, the, fir the, the first uh, Republic Bank, which is a bank that is also important to the ecosystem and provides a lot of mortgages to workers and to founders and to investors, um, as, well, as well as offering some other services, right? So it's just, again, it's like, you know, one, it's, uh, disconnect from the reality that most people have, but also a disregard for it, right? Because th it, that's an inconvenient fact. And so it gets memory hold and we have to focus on the new narrative that's going to be pushed out, right? Um, and and that was really what was going on. And that was just being pushed and hammered and hammered and hammered all weekend, especially with people like, as you mentioned earlier, Kalanakis, who had, you know, had no shame about just straight up lying. I mean, this guy was tweeting pictures from Mad Max being like, in all caps, being like, I'm going to get my guns and I'm going to get my gasoline and I'm going to get my water, you know, and that's, and as if like that would happen as if, as if there was any real risk of there being an economic collapse. And there's also my, another my, theory my, my, that he really did believe that, which is even more scary and concerning also Oof, that would <laughs> yes that i i, I gotta bring up uh because i've been thinking about this the this this back and forth between uh calacanis and this random rep person in their replies uh freddie reynolds i don't know if he's, he's in anybody uh a crypto uh person it seems but this was a funny exchange so so jason tweets out uh calacanis tweets out on Monday, 100,000 Americans will be lined up, this is all caps, will be lined up at their regional bank demanding their money. Most will not get it. Now, again, we're talking on Monday, uh, the Monday he was discussing, and none of this happened, uh, obviously. This went from Silicon Valley insiders on Thursday to the middle class on Saturday. Main Street finds out on Monday, he said. Now, none of this happened, again, but he said this, and then so this guy, Freddie Reynolds, replies to him, since when do Main Street Americans have more than 250000 in their checking account? And uh, Calacatus goes, the company they work for does. <laughs> and and so, so, so Freddie Reynolds with a great response here goes, wait, so they're lining up at the bank for their employer? <laughs> 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 like just they don't even yeah like, actually i mean like, i'm here for what? my workplace i'm here to withdraw two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the company account <laughs> oh. 
I mean, these guys are the the worst, the worst. You know, you, you, and I'm glad you mentioned just now about the contagion because let's get into that. The contagion. We heard about this. I even said because I saw people using because uh, I guess people, you know, when they're looking at this stuff and they're reading stuff from David Sachs and the Jason Calacanises of the world. And they're seeing this stuff and they're seeing these guys also then conflate um, Signature Bank um, and Silvergate. And I'll say it didn't help uh, for the narrative uh, specifically that, um, you know, the Treasury or the Federal Reserve or whoever came out and announced that they were going to, you know, they were going to make the uh, depositors of um, SVB whole. And also, by the way, Signature Bank, another bank, uh, breaking news, we also just took them over uh, just now. Whoever Mm -hmm. decided to conflate those two announcements as one, I think made a big mistake with the narrative uh, being pushed. Um, But anyway, I saw these guys, these VCs and these fear mongers run with this. And I had to say, listen, uh, this is not proof of a contagion. These are two banks, and we'll get a little bit more into this in a second. These are two, Silvergate and Signature Bank, these are two banks who had problems that were well known about for months. In fact, Silvergate, you know, shut down on its own voluntarily, uh, you know, liquidated liquidated its assets days before uh, Signature Bank, excuse me, um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank got taken over by regulators. Um, So... I had mentioned this is not proof of a contagion. And then this morning I had a bunch of people come in and go, have you seen what's going on with the stocks? What do you mean no contagion, you clown? And it's like, no, the stock market feelings and sentiment does not mean contagion because the people on the stock market are deciding to either A, try to create things or B, just trying to go uh, by how they feel the industry is headed. You know, that does not mean that there's a contagion spreading, that people are in mass uh, withdrawing their deposits from these banks, creating a similar issue that happened with SVB. Those are not the, that's not the same thing. Yeah, I think. You know, an important lesson that has to be reiterated on a broad level, the stock market is not the economy, right? When Meta, I mean, fuck Facebook, I've been trying not to call it um, Meta, but when Facebook lost $700 billion in in market capitalization, it would have been an idiotic thing to say that the company is going to die that year or that this is the end of the of, of. of Facebook, you know, there are other things you can say. And like, you know, when, when that happened, I wrote about how this suggests or this should let us know that social media, as Facebook is presenting, it does not exist and it never did exist. Right. So we should just say that concept is dead. But Facebook is not dead. Right. It just lost 700 billion dollars, which is to say that Facebook, this company, which makes hundreds of billions of dollars or it makes hundreds, you know, hundred, hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, um, more money than God in revenue. Um, lost money because investors lost confidence in its operations or its inability to provide a return that they thought was satisfactory in you know x time frame and so we'd have to act in ways to get that confidence back like laying off of the workers right when you see the stocks losing the money the, there are a few things to ask like what else is going on in the economy like the fact the fact that the three banks that collapsed two of them were crypto connected Crypto, which has for the past two years been in the middle of an ongoing series of crashes and liquidity crunches, right? And scams and frauds and thefts. Um, and Silicon Valley, which was had a, you know, had a run on the bank because venture capitalists are herd animals and, and rushed for the door at the second that they thought there would be risk. Um, these are the reasons why these places collapse. But other banks are not ruled by such fickle forces. You know, like no, no bank is no bank other than these banks was touching crypto or crypto firms. Right. No other bank has such an undiversified depositor base. Uh, And we should say there are other banks that they're few and far between now, but there are other banks that do deal with crypto companies and exchanges. But they're not like crypto centric like these two banks were. These banks banks were off. Yeah, these banks were especially especially Silvergate. Silvergate. They basically were like, yeah, we're just the the bank for crypto. Nothing's going to happen there. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's gonna go wrong with that. Which is also funny because in their in their in their filings they acknowledged they were like, if anything happened to crypto, we would be screwed. But good thing that's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> 
we have nothing to worry about. No, uh, no so you're right. You know, we're, there are banks that are involved with crypto, and then there are banks that are involved with crypto. Um, and it's the ones that were involved that were overexposed because being involved in crypto is not like being involved in Silicon Valley, right? Because you have the additive risk where you're not even you're not even really dealing with deposits. You're dealing with money that's floating around until it settles a trade or a transaction or money that you're holding on behalf until people have a run on that exchange, which was happening because there were all the crunches and liquidity crunches that came from the FTX collapse, that came from the from the Luna ecosystem collapse, that have been coming from the ongoing redu reduced interest in Ethereum and blockchain and, and Bitcoin and in their related projects. So, you know, these are things that are just volatile at every single level. It makes you would be an idiot to build a business around them, let alone a banking business, especially because a banking business is a so much more straightforward, safer, reliable, clear cut business. It's pretty hard to fuck that up, right? Unless you're doing a weird thing like dealing with crypto or right. you know like peter thiel tried to do making a woke bank an anti-woke bank you know if you do weird caveats like that that go against established principles for banking you're gonna fail um and that's what we've been seeing right all these other banks are secure are like i don't want to i'm not i don't want to sound like a shill for the finance industry you know but they're fine <laughs> they really are fine compared to this and if they're not i'll eat i'll eat crow you know i'll eat a hat but um i just it's it's there's nothing near anywhere of the risk what happened at svb what happened at, uh what happened at silvergate what happened at um signature our play uh, is comes down to the matter like you were talking about that at the top of the episode this tech ecosystem, even if there are core products and offerings and services that may be good and provide value, it has gotten so bloated, so bubble frothy, um, that there's a lot of fraud, there's a lot of arbitrage, there's a lot of inflated value, there's a lot of vaporware, that it would make, it makes little to no sense, unless you think that you can really, you're deft enough to avoid that, it makes a little sense to then try to say, Oh well, um, nothing else can go wrong. I mean, it's really it's what, what it ends up being is they're just looking at the current success of this sector, not thinking about the underlying roots of it and thinking it will go on forever. But the underlying roots of it are very uh, they're bracketed in a lot of asterisks and a lot of historical exceptions and a lot of ex uh, contingent economic uh, factors, which over time have been getting slowly pared back and pruned back and complicated by other developments in the economy and in the world and in our politics. So it was never it was never a smart bet. It might have seemed like a smart bet. It seems it always seems like a smart bet in the middle of a bubble to bet on the bubble, right? And then the bubble bursts and you're and you're screwed. Right, right. It's you know, I, I wasn't gonna I wasn't uh I was unsure if we were gonna fit this in the episode, but you you gave me the perfect segue by bringing up uh, Peter Thiel's uh, failed unwoke bank. Um, this latest sort of, I, I don't know what the the idea behind this, I mean, this doesn't seem to be a, a way to really prop up the VCs in any way, even though we've seen over the past couple of years this new alliance between these VCs and the, you know, the, the uh, sort of... Uh, anti uh social justice anti woke far right um but this seems divorced from trying to help the vcs because i saw a lot of these guys were actually knocking them too uh for about for slightly different reasons but um the latest i've seen the new uh talking point i've seen on this was in the wall street journal too so this isn't just like the extremes of fox news even though you know obviously wall street journal is still a right wing uh, outlet they, they still have this this <coughs> excuse me this uh you know old school sort of essence of being like a serious financial institution though um uh they're in their write up on this they tried to blame uh the push for uh diversity and equity i think it's like the the term in the industry is like dei um it's these, you know, these programs that all these big corporations uh, have done over the past couple of years, especially uh, where they try to, you know, appeal to 
the the ever diversifying uh, uh, American populace. To be quite frank, that's really all it's about. Uh, they're putting. Uh, they're realizing that America is not uh, going to be a majority, uh, you know, white or even just being led by majority white men forever, and that there are more. Uh, people of all shapes, sizes, colors, sexual orientations, etc. Um, uh, uh, in in the United States in general, and also uh, making various different decisions in, in the, the the business and working world. Um, so they've decided that this is a good opportunity for us. We gotta, you know move with the time so we keep making money and that's really the real basis for this stuff is it's not because all of a sudden uh you know jp morgan or goldman sachs are all of a sudden <laughs> super woke and they care about uh this stuff but um today all you saw was the right wing blaming the failure of silicon valley bank on wokeness and like them trying to appeal to like i don't know the lgbtq community or having programs to like hire like one extra black person a year or something like mm -hmm. that like really the most like minuscule uh you know just so we can say we did it type programs that's what they were blaming on the failure of silicon valley bank which is um I mean, you know, Andy Kessler is a stupid is a is a special type of idiot at the Wall Street Journal op-ed um, section. Um, and you know, the, the, a commitment to being as wrong as possible, as often as possible. And um, you know, this take is you know is really it's so stupid. It's hard to even call it racist. It's just like so deeply idiotic. The idea that. Um, when did, what was the line he said? Uh, Twelve angry white men wouldn't have done this. Oh, I'll pull it up because it was it was it was enough to really we got to quote this because it's it's really bad. Yeah, okay. Um, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, was there regulatory failure? Perhaps SVB. Perhaps. <laughs> SVB was regulated like a bank, but looked more like a money market fund. Then there's this. In its proxy statement, SVB notes that besides 91% of their board being independent and 45% women, they also have one black, one LGBTQ+, and two veterans. I'm not saying 12 white men would have avoided this mess, but the company may have been distracted by diversity demands. You know I mean, what the, the, in, the company was distracted by the big, fat wad of cash that venture capitalists put in their bank and the problem that they didn't actually have any place to put it the idea that if they hadn't had dei as if they they're not even committed to dei but as if if they didn't have dei they would have had 10 extra brain cells to focus on the intractable problem of what do you do with 120 billion dollars in, in deposits that we have no actual real way of deploying effectively except in bonds because interest rates are low because we're not going to become a venture capital fund ourselves right and we can't find people to loan them i mean it's it's just so it's so stupid it's bafflingly stupid because i don't even i don't like it's just it's just really hard to engage with like what do, like does he believe that in meetings where they could have been doing risk management they were instead saying okay we need more poc and someone's in the corner being like, no, but what about interest rates? What about interest rates? It's like, no, no. <laughs> hey, next, next time, next time. Today we are focusing on who our next PLC member is going to be, our executive is going to be. It's so stupid. It's childish, you know? Right, right. It's, yeah, it's almost like... <laughs> Like imagine like this meeting now where it's like, uh, like the 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 uh the security risk officers are being like, uh, uh sir, like to the CEO and like the the CF, like all the executives at the the meetings, like, oh, sir, we're in some real danger here, and the CEO interrupts like, yeah, in danger of only having one gay on our board. We need to, <laughs> we need to hire another. And you can see this also is an argument where it's very interesting because it's like the, uh, people have been testing out what kind of woke argument they're going to use. And, you know, there were some people who were like, oh, the Fed trapped the SVB. The Fed is responsible. The CEO was a former um, – was on the board of the, uh, the Fed, was a Fed director in San Francisco, right? So he had a good understanding of, um, of the risk that was going on here. So there are two conclusions. One – 
you can make a reasonable conclusion based on the history of finance and business and banking that he decided that the risk was not that big because he was smarter than the market or he had a better view of what the market would be like. And so he could keep going on his business as usual. Or you could have this convoluted harebrained theory that he was too busy uh, overlooking DI requirements and trying to figure out how many non-white people or non many could put on the board. Uh, or in the executive team and it's like you just you really you just have to be an idiot to believe the second one <laughs> you know? right i mean yeah it's it's beyond i mean i guess it's just one way for them to not blame the actual issue i mean that's not the real surprise there and i'm sure we'll be seeing um i mean we'll certainly be seeing uh, all sorts of different uh vcs and and tech lobbyists uh, work put the work in right now to uh, and any sort of future regulation I'm sure will be shaped in some way by them uh, as they they realize they need to get more involved here uh, you know it is and then of course you saw the crypto there were crypto advocates who were using this as like oh glad I have my money in uh, in crypto uh, to, to avoid problems like this and it's like it's like dude have you have you been asleep for the past eight months? Where, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and they have. Uh, they have been asleep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess we should end it on a, a funny note. And that is that um, the while while they did fear, while these VCs did fear monger about this stuff, um, they also really do think that they... I, like I, maybe you, maybe you. I think it's funny because I don't think they did, but maybe you have a different opinion here. Maybe I am wrong, but I, I, I think they are patting themselves on the back, like they're doing like the whole like, oh, my work here is done. And it's like, what do you mean you didn't do anything? It's like I, like, <laughs> like they didn't like the, the Biden and, and the Fed and the Treasury. They were gonna clearly do something to make sure that the the fears that were the natural fears of seeing this happen were gonna. Uh, be taken care of like you said even that first day they said that they were gonna uh, deal with the issue and people would get most of their money if not all of it uh, it wasn't until this fear mongering uh maybe they decide to uh you know uh change a little bit here and there but they were always going to deal with the situation but these guys screaming and crying on Twitter, I, I didn't look at them as actually doing anything to fix the issue for themselves, I should say. Uh, they didn't even do that. To me, it was just like uh, 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 a crisis control PR or something, trying to uh, 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 form a, nar a, a narrative to try to maybe uh, they were hoping, I guess, to, to point the anger in a direction that wasn't at them, which they failed miserably at that, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> In fact, they probably redoubled it. You know, I think right. it is, it's beautiful. They did the work for us, right? You don't even really have to convince people that much anymore that venture cap, there's something that venture capitalists are doing that's an affront to the world that we want. They just get it. You know, they get it and they get mad. And this didn't help with all of them begging for a bailout, not thinking about, wow, um, okay, so most of these people at the same time have also said that student loan debt relief shouldn't happen because it's a bailout or that we shouldn't you know, provide more uh, pandemic relief to people because that's a bailout. And these things, they distort the markets and they, they, they foster negative um, incentives and they increase inflation and they have these huge costs we have to think of. And then the second they have any little bit of trouble, they start crying and screaming for a bailout. So. I, I I'm so glad you brought up the student loan thing, and I'm kicking myself right now for not bringing it up earlier. So many of these guys, if you look through their their you know their tweet history, if you look through like the transcripts of their like speeches that are uploaded to YouTube or whatever, these guys like David Sachs and Jason Calacanis and the you know the the uh, Andreessens and the the uh, the Teals and the uh, uh, all these guys were some of the most uh, uh, hardcore anti-student loan forgiveness people out there. Mm -hmm. And they were all about, we should not be doing this. We should not be bailing these people out. They put themselves into this mess by taking out a predatory loan. A lot of ways, a lot of, uh, in a lot of instances, they were 
uh, told that these sold these loans in, in ways that didn't really uh, explain to them exactly what they were getting into. In other instances, uh, you know, people, especially around my age range, we, we took out student loans and then we were literally graduated into the fucking 2008 financial crisis. What the fuck were those people supposed to do already? And everyone who came after them, especially, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, these are guys who are anti that. But they were all aboard for this. And they bring up the whole thing like, oh, you know, uh, the people who who banked with SVB, you know, they didn't they didn't take they didn't. You know, how were they sp- sp- supposed to know this was going to happen? How were the people who took out the student loans 10, 20 years ago supposed to know that these various industries would collapse? The fucking entire financial system was going to collapse taking down industries that actually were once in a much much healthier position in certain ways. How were some of these, so many of these students uh, and people who took out student loans, how were they supposed to, uh, you know, uh, 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 plan for those sorts of uh, uh, things that interfered with them, just like what happened at SVB interfered with the good old depositors who were just putting their money somewhere. They're so out of touch. They really are. They're so out of touch. <clears throat> it's gonna get worse. I do think it's gonna get worse, you know. And this, and this, you know, brings us to the question of like, what are we gonna do about it? Like, how are we gonna figure out to reduce the power that these people have as they get more and more decoupled from re- reality and unmoored from, you know, basic uh, com- common shared exp- uh, experience of reality? Um, what are we gonna do to reduce their economic power? What are we gonna do to re- reduce their political power? What are we gonna do to reduce the ability of them to transfer one into the other? You know, how are we going to slowly bring in, um, you know, bring in and rein in these forces? And as Keynes was saying, you know, euthanize the rentier. How are we going to make sure that they are not able to hoard this capital, uh, to arbitrate and speculate on it, to arbitrage regulation and arbitrage laws to generate, you know, uh, more more money and exploit more workers and exploit more legal systems and markets and political systems? And that's really the that's the big question I think of you know the coming time. How are we going to figure out what to do with these people and their ability to generate so much money and political power? And it's going to require a lot of like creative laws and regulations and reforms that that you know scale back um, the money that they have, the inf- the the portfolio companies that they've been able to build. They're on, you know, the types of companies that we're allowed and types of products and services we're willing to, you know, have operate privately and the role of the public sector and displacing a lot of these places and providing alternative sources of capital and taking up risks that these venture capitalists say that they are but aren't really or to uh, or, you know, taking up risks that no one else is taking actually, right? It's going to, we're going to have to, if we don't like venture capitalists, displace them, right? So that they can go off and be like, you know, coders, right, or something. I guess like they can all learn to code and and work at the startups that uh-huh. they insist they want to build. Um, that would be a better use of their time, uh, and our and and a better use of our society's resources. Frankly, right. Someone should create the Uber for non-technical founders to learn to code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Agueso Jr., freelance writer, writer of the Tech Bubble newsletter and co-host of the This Machine Kills podcast. And also check out his piece that just came out in Slate, The Incredible Tantrum Venture Capitalist Threw Over Silicon Valley Bank, which also I have to say, I just saw uh, this just popped up on my Twitter feed as I'm talking to you, a founder and investor named Nate Fisher. (laughs) With a glowing, uh, uh, <laughs> a glowing recommendation of your article, saying this sort of rhetoric is how you end up with things like the Rwandan genocide. That's so crazy, dude! Uh, it's like okay, it's like guys, <laughs> it's it's really it's you know what the funny part is? So many of them have been screaming about the fact that I said we have to euthanize these par- we that I said venture capitalists are parasites I explained why I think they're parasites and I said em- euthanizing them is imperative if we want a better world if you read the article a, a herculean task I know but if you read it I use parasite once and I use it in comp- saying that venture capitalists are even more impressive than parasites because parasites can't get you to destroy your own body your environment 
and then sing praises about them and, and, and do more work to make the body and the environment even more inviting for them. Parasites don't do that. Venture capitalists can, right? But these people don't fucking read. And so <laughs> they, get mad. they get fucking mad about the tweet, which, you know, look, it was, I did troll. I trolled a little bit. I knew because I was referencing a, a line that I thought would, would resonate and maybe spark some debate. And instead it just sparked a lot of crying. Um, I like that though. That's good. We want, we want, we want them crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, it's been, it's, it's kind of really been fun. And early in the day, I was just like, why is no one like, you know, really engaging? Like, why aren't VCs like engaging with and do, doing like long threads, arguing? Cause I would love to just like have to see someone's coherent thoughts dis- disputing what I'm saying. And I got the opposite of, I kind of got what I wanted, but not really, because now I just get long threads of VCs explaining why this is um, a call for mass extermination of, of VCs. <laughs> uh, well, you know, they uh, they do it to themselves, really. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> they really do. Edward, where can people uh, find you online? Feel free to drop websites, social media handles, really whatever you'd like. Feel free to also... Uh, tease what you're working on coming up whatever the floor is yours take as much time as you'd like drop as many plugs as you'd like go ahead well you already you plugged my podcast and my newsletter i'm a freelance journalist i don't work at slate some people have been sending me angry emails saying that they're going to report my article to slate Um, oh no they won't realize (laughs) they don't realize the article they published like what (laughs) oh and um you know, the stuff I'll be working on in the coming words, weeks and months, I am really trying. I'm really seriously interested in, like, trying to sketch out concrete alternatives to the private venture capital system. And I want to follow up this essay with a, a longer one um, that will dive into a few alternatives that I think are interesting but would probably have to happen together. I'll have um, pieces on the gig economy and crypto and and, and some startups and, and, and venture capital funds I'm interested in because of people they're investing in. Uh, and all those will be coming out in the you know, next few months. So, you know, just keep an eye out for that. The newsletter, once I start it up again, will be a weekly thing. Podcast is, you know, twice a week. And these articles will be coming out in the interregnum. Awesome. Uh, and it sounds like, uh, you know, without any specifics, it does sound like uh, numerous uh, opportunities for you to come back on this show to talk about what you're working on. Oh, yes. Uh, awesome. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, glad to finally have you on the show, Edward. Uh, thanks for joining me. It was great. And uh, have a great night. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in on this week's episode of Scam Economy. We did things a little bit different this time. We certainly talked about crypto, but it wasn't entirely crypto-centric. Broadening our horizons a bit, after all, this show is called The Scam Economy, and there are plenty of crypto-adjacent niches worthy of discussion. Once again, to support this show, go to patreon.com slash mattbinder and become a monthly paying subscriber. Your support helps this show grow. Go to youtube.com slash mattbinder and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you want, you could also catch the video version of this episode and all the previous episodes there, and feel free to drop a super chat and or super thanks on that episode if you would like to give like a one-off monetary tip same over at twitch.tv slash matt binder where you can connect your amazon prime account to your twitch account and get a free twitch prime subscription every month that's a paid subscription to give to your favorite creator that costs you nothing more than the regular amount you pay for your amazon prime subscription and of course go to scameconomy.com for all the links to the audio version of this show and while you're at apple podcasts or spotify be sure to leave a review you can follow the show on twitter at scam economy you can follow me on twitter at matt binder and with all that said i'll see you all next time on the scam economy <laughs> <laughs>